Okay, it's time. Share screen. Do you see it? Okay. Let me see if I can use the. Um, yeah. So the uh, uh, the Natalie asked an excellent question on Wednesday. Why is the ocean blue? And I'm embarrassed that I I didn't know the answer right away. But I, I did point out that there's an issue with the absorption of light in water. And, and so I looked around and indeed I found a data on this. So Wikipedia is so useful on this kind of stuff. So this is the absorption in, in the unit of one per meter as a function of the wavelength. So what, what it means is that basically the light gets absorbed by the inverse of these numbers. So if you look at about 700 nanometers wavelength, that's the red light. So you see one up there. So, so it, it penetrates into water only by about a meter and then it gets totally absorbed. But if you go to the blue light, like 450, it's 0.01. So it can not be absorbed. Uh, it, it would not be absorbed within about a hundred meters. So the blue light would reach much deeper part of the ocean. So this is how the, uh, the wavelength uh, would change the absorption rate. So the red light gets very quickly absorbed by the ocean water and that's why we don't see the red light coming out of it. And so that is apparently the, the main reason why the ocean looks blue. So that kind of makes sense. And I sort of remember this absorption issue because I was once watching a TV show about the, uh, uh, the color of different fish. And uh, this is the red snapper, which I eat. And uh, uh, the, you, know, you, you may ask the question, why are they so bright orange? Because if they are very visible in the ocean, you know they, they might be a, a easy target for predators, right? But it turns out that if, given that they live relatively in a deep ocean, the orange light does not reach the deep uh, deep ocean, so they don't reflect any light at all. So they become sort of invisible at the depth. So that's why uh, having this kind of bright orange color doesn't actually uh, threaten them. Uh, because it, the, uh, the predators wouldn't see them really uh, deep in the ocean because there's no red uh, orange light down there. So, uh, so, so definitely, so the absorption light is uh, one of the main reasons, but the, somebody also said, I think that was Napoli too, that the reflection of skylight is probably also part of it, but probably not main part because the, again, the Wikipedia page pointed out that if you look at the uh, indoor pool, swimming pool, the water also looks a little bit bluish and there's no skylight that gets reflected by uh, uh, the indoor uh, swimming pool. So the absorption seems to be really the main factor for this uh, blueness of the ocean water. So, so that's what I learned. So uh, I appreciate that uh, Natalie asked this question. Is she there? No. Okay. <laughs> I, ho I, hope, I hope, hope, hope she would watch the lecture and video later on. Okay, any questions about this? Okay, so now we'd like to wrap up this discussion on the resonance and then move on to uh, Lorenz invariant QFD finally. So I presented this apparent paradox that if you send in a photon whose energy precisely corresponds to the energy difference between say ground state and excited state of an atom, then this energy denominator seems to diverge and you seem to get an infinite cross section. But I pointed out that that's actually not the case because you have to include actually imaginary part to the energy of this excited state because it actually decays. And any state that has a finite lifetime ends up having this imaginary part to its energy. And that's something you can figure out from the second order perturbation theory. When you compute a second order energy shift, uh, you learn this formula in quantum mechanics class. You may not have had this I epsilon in the denominator, and, and the only discrete sum over the intermediate energy states. But when you have the continuum for the intermediate states, then that would necessarily pass through this pole where energy of the intermediate state becomes the same as energy of the initial state. And that's why you need to actually keep this I epsilon, with, which we derived when we were talking about time dependent perturbation theory. So back then, I epsilon was introduced just for the purpose of making the integral over the infinite time interval converge. And so that was introduced for the purpose of the convenience to make the uh, all the expressions become manifestly finite. But this I epsilon then now turns out to be really essential because this is the way that it gives you a prescription 
on how to avoid the pole by going through the semicircle above the pole, not below the pole. And using the semicircle, you obtain this imaginary part in the energy shift. And that's exactly turns out to be the, the inverse lifetime of the uh, 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 of this excited state. So the 2p state of the hydrogen atom, therefore, has a complex energy now. Uh, the real part is just the energy itself, but the imaginary part is the inverse lifetime over two. So that's the uh, imaginary part. And once you have this combination coming into the Schrodinger equation, then you do find that this state actually decay exponentially. So that's how you see that this imaginary part of the energy is indeed precisely related to the lifetime of this unstable state. So this is what I already explained on Wednesday. And so what I need to finish up on this discussion is to make this a little bit more formal. So now that we have this uh, uh, imaginary part of the energy of the intermediate state, uh, this cross-section no longer diverges, it stays finite, which is good. In addition, when you're looking at the behavior of the cross-section near this pole, then you can forget about this first term, which doesn't get enhanced. So just focus on the second term. You can also make an approximation that numerator is more or less constant as a function of energy. Then you would predict the, sh the shape of the cross-section near this resonance now uh, to be just given by this Lorentzian form. So taking the uh, absolute square of this E minus E plus I gamma over two, and clearly E minus E is real, I gamma is imaginary. So taking absolute squared, I take the real part squared and imaginary part squared. So that would be the expression. And this is obviously peaked when EI and EM are the same so that the real part vanishes. That's where the peak is. And as energy moves away from this peak, then this real part grows and therefore this, uh, the function starts to drop. And this gamma here corresponds to four with half maximum. So uh, you look at the, the point where the size of this peak is exactly the half of the peak. And then the width, full width, when this is the half of the peak is the full width half maximum, FWHM, and that is, yeah, is the gamma. So the lifetime of a unstable uh, 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 state will correspond to the width of the energy distribution in the cross section. So that's what, what I showed you in some data uh, where I come back to this, where you see some of the width in the nuclear transitions and the particle transitions. So the, the unstable states with relatively short lifetime really does show the finite width in the cross section. So that's what I talked about already on Wednesday. So the thing I need to wrap up with is really to understand this correspondence between this form of the shape in energy domain to the exponential behavior in a time domain and the relationship turns out to be just a Fourier transform as you would probably expect. So if you have this expression, E minus E plus I gamma over two in, in energy domain, or if you use H bar, this is a frequency domain. And suppose you do the Fourier transform of this function. And when you have this Fourier uh, 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 factor in the numerator, you can extend your integral over this energy real axis to go down on a semicircle in the lower half plane, because when T is positive and going E to have negative imaginary part, this would give you exponentially suppressed contribution at the infinity. So adding this semicircle is not gonna change the result of this integral, but by extending to the lower half plane, then this is now a closed contour which encircles this pole, then you find this finite integral at the end of the day. Namely that you pick up the pole where EI is at EM minus I gamma M over two. So you insert EI into the exponent by EM minus I gamma over two. So that's the expression you find as a result of the integral. On the other hand, when T is negative, this semicircle would be exponentially large so I'm not allowed to extend the contour this way. Instead, I'm supposed to extend the contour to the upper half plane where the semicircle is exponentially suppressed once again. But in this case, this contour doesn't enclose the pole because the pole is on the lower half plane. Therefore I get zero. And that actually makes sense 
because this unstable state is not there naturally. Because if it's there naturally, then it would have all decayed away by now. So you have to create an excited state. And that's why this happens only after time zero. And of course, you can change the time if you actually put the uh, a different time offset in the exponent. So you can choose time whatever you like. But it does not exist before a certain time because it's an unstable state. But from, from a certain time on, this state can exist. But then you also see that there's an exponential decay. So minus i times minus i here gives you minus one times gamma over two times t. So this is an exponentially decaying profile as a function of time. And if you take the absolute square of this, that will give you a probability, then probability does go like e to the minus t over tau, and that's the exponential decay law. So now what you see here is they're really in one-to-one -one correspondence of this exponentially decaying profile versus this uh, Lorentzian form of the cross section. And they are related simply by the Fourier transform to each other. And the width of this energy, half with half maximum, full with half maximum, is related to the lifetime of the state. And that's yet another manifestation of this energy time uncertainty principle. So delta E in this case is the width, delta T is the lifetime. And in this case, this is a precise relationship that gamma times tau is really h bar. So we don't need twiddle here. They are meant to be really equal for this particular case because the half with half, full with half maximum is well defined for the Lorentzian function. Tau from the exponential decay is also well defined. You can measure in experimental data and then you can compare them against each other and you find this product is precisely one. So that's the energy time uncertain principle between the width of the resonance and the lifetime of that unstable state. So that sort of a closes up this discussion here. Any questions about this slide? Um, I have a question. Um, Go ahead, Gamma. So, so with this imaginary term, like, does it have any relationship to talking about like an observable? Because it sounds like you're now including this like imaginary term for like what your Hamiltonian would be uh, normally. Mm -hmm. And right. like, could you associate that with an observable? Because it doesn't seem to be like Hermitian are like in that nature. Yeah, yeah. So there's several ways of answering this question. So what is observable is when the lifetime is very long, then you can definitely measure the lifetime just by looking at the number of radioactive decays, for example. So lifetime mm -hmm. is something you can measure. On the other hand, when lifetime is short, the width is something you can measure, just like what I have shown in some of this uh, nuclear physics and particle physics data, that this width is something you can measure experimentally. So either way, you can measure something that will correspond to the imaginary part of the energy. So I would say that this is actually observable. And then you have yet another question, which is a very good one. So Hamiltonian is a Hermitian operator. Its eigenvalue was supposed to be real. So how come we are talking about quote unquote energy uh, 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 eigenvalue to be complex? And this is what I learned from the textbook by Landau and Lifsitz. So when you're talking about the, uh, the unstable state, suppose you have some potential well in which you can have sort of a quasi bound state, but that can sort of escape to the infinity and that's a decay. You can set up some potential barrier, barrier in quantum mechanics problem and really uh, try to come up with that kind of situation. And indeed, what we know is the, the nuclear alpha decay is a tunneling phenomenon because the coulomb potential acts like a, a, a energy barrier for a positively charged the uh, alpha particle. And so the alpha particle inside the nucleus basically needs to tunnel to the Coulomb barrier to actually decay into a free alpha particle. So indeed, you do have physical example of this type. Hmm. But if you set up the problem that way, then you are talking about a wave that actually escapes from potential well. And that kind of wave would be actually at the exponential rising towards infinity. So if you have a big wave at the inside the potential wave craft, and you have a wave going outside, but exponentially rising towards infinity. And if you actually low, if you let this uh, uh, the state uh, go down exponentially, like, like this, then exponentially rising tail looks like it's sort of escaping to the infinity. That you indeed find a solution to the Schrodinger equation in, in the case of this uh, the potential barrier. 
which has this exponentially rising behavior towards infinity. And when you actually prove that the eigenvalue of the Hamiltonian has to be real, then that proof actually requires integration by parts because Hamiltonian has, let's say, p squared of 2m in it. The p squared of 2m has derivative squared in it. And if you do the integration by parts and let one of the derivative act on psi dagger instead of psi, then the whole thing becomes absolute real. And then you know uh, that is a real quantity. Mm. But for the exponential rising wave function, then there is a boundary term you cannot ignore. So this proof that Hamiltonian eigenvalue is real actually breaks down for that kind of state. Mm. So indeed, you do find eigenstate of the Hamiltonian with a complex eigenvalue with this exponentially rising profile. And so I'm gonna actually post a, uh, 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 the lecture notes and a homework problem I actually prepared for 221B demonstrating this point and, uh, 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 and, and they put that on B courses and I, I let you know once they post it. So you can actually really see that uh, complex eigenvalue is indeed possible for the Hamiltonian in that context. Does that Perfect, answer your question? You. Okay. Yeah, good. that really does. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay. So now this word called resonance, because the resonance is something you have studied probably in classical mechanics using harmonic oscillator. So suppose you have a harmonic oscillator, m y double dot plus m omega square y vanishes. But suppose also that you have a friction term b y dot. So this gives you a force proportional to the velocity, and that's nothing but the friction. So this friction term try to stop the vibration of this harmonic oscillator. And you, on top of it, you actually force this oscillator by coupling into a source with a certain frequency. So the idea is that when the frequency of the source matches the frequency of the harmonic oscillator, you have a resonance. So amplitude starts to grow. And if you actually solve this classical equation in the absence of the friction term, you find something similar to what we observed in a paradox before, namely that the amplitude y starts to grow like a power law indefinitely. So that's very similar to the situation of the paradox we mentioned, namely that the cross section seems to diverge when the frequency or energy of the photon you send in precisely matches the energy difference between the ground state and the, the uh, excited state. But then you put in this, uh, 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 the friction term. Once you put in the friction term, then the, this ex, uh, the indefinite growth doesn't happen anymore. It stops. And when it stops, you find a sort of stationary solution. And for the stationary solution, you find the amplitude is given by this expression over here. So it's stationary in the sense that this is just an oscillating solution, similar to the stationary state in quantum mechanics. And the amplitude doesn't grow indefinitely anymore. It stops with this amplitude. But where this amplitude stops, as you can see, has this Lorentzian form, omega squared minus omega squared squared plus V squared omega squared. So this is the Lorentzian form we have seen in the quantum mechanics from the energy denominator. So this is actually a very analogous phenomenon. And the friction has the meaning of the basically lifetime or width of this peak. And so the B, the friction term, basically corresponds to the half, a full width half maximum of the Lorentzian function. And where the, you get this maximum of this Lorentzian function is really when the frequency of this force matches up the frequency of the harmonic oscillator and that's what we call the resonance in the case of classical mechanics. And so what you're seeing here is mathematically the same thing. So that's why we also call this, the quantum mechanical phenomenon, a resonance, because it really matches the uh, 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 intuition we get from a resonance in classical physics. And as you know, that if you have a guitar and if you have, bring in a, a tuning fork, and if the, uh, the pitch of a string and if the pitch of the tuning fork matches up, even if, if though you are not touching the string at all, then string starts to vibrate and that's the resonance. But of course the vibration string does come with a friction because it's not ideal, uh, you know, hypothetical string here. 
And so uh, the, 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 the vibration doesn't grow indefinitely. We would never see that. It, it stops with a certain amplitude. And that amplitude is indeed given by this functional form. So if the tuning fork is slightly off pitch, it doesn't grow very much. If it's really right on, it grows quite a bit, but it still doesn't grow indefinitely. And that's something you can really experience with a, uh, any musical instrument you might play uh, with a tuning fork. And so uh, that's, that's the phenomenon we're familiar with. And so the, the width is really playing the important role here to, keeping, to keep the cross-section finite in the case of quantum physics. And the width of that the Lorentzian form uh, is it naturally correspond to some, some kind of idea like friction. And friction is what lets the vibration decay. So the intuition also matches up from the context too. So I hope this analogy makes sense because this is really connects to something we can experience in a daily life if you play any music at all. And so uh, uh, hopefully that actually makes sense. So any questions about this analogy? No questions? Okay, good. So then that really wraps up for this discussion about the resonances. And uh, so, so then we can now move into the Lorentz invariant quantum field theory. So just to recap what we have done, we started out with non relativistic QFD, the Schrodinger field theory, and we quantized it and got particles out. We also studied the fact that the classical wave limit of QFD has a physical meaning in terms of Bose-Einstein condensate or laser uh, as a coherent state. Then we looked at a different problem. We tried to quantize the electromagnetic field and couple that to a point particle instead. In point particle, we described it with a non relativistic point particle with the kinetic energy of P square of 2m. And we could study various phenomena of the emission of photons from the atoms, scattering of light by atoms, radius scattering, why the sky is blue and stuff. And so that's what we just finished discussing. But, when, but then we need to actually put things together now because the electromagnetism is actually Lorentz invariant. So far, matter part is not Lorentz invariant. We need to make everything Lorentz invariant. And that's, that's when we once again have to go back to QFT to describe the matter part of, of physics. So we could describe interaction of the normative particle with the electromagnetic field in a normative limit using quantum mechanics. Of course, the electromagnetic field is a field theory, but particle side we so far described with the quantum mechanics. But once you want to make also matter part relativistic and Lorentz invariant, you have to treat both of them using quantum field theory. So that's a subject we like to move into right now. So here's a quick review of relativity. And I don't know if uh, I have studied relativity in some other classes. I think you have done some in freshman physics, but maybe not at the level of this kind of uh, uh, the rigor. So I need to quickly review this. So as you all know, the relativity is supposed to unify space and time into a single concept called space-time. And speed of light C is actually just a conclusion constant between space and time. The minute you know that you have to treat space and time on an equal footing, you need to use the common unit for them. And normally we measure space with like meters in time with seconds. They are not on the equal footing. We need to put them on an equal footing by using the same units. So by using the speed of light, you can convert time into meters, or you can convert space and measure it with seconds. And for example, if you're doing a high energy particle physics experiments, then size of the detector can be measured on nanosecond time scale, because that's pretty much as much time it takes for particles to fly from the collision point to the de detector. And you have to build a time of flight counter, which is actually better than nanosecond timing resolution to measure the arrival time to discriminate different kinds of particles of different masses, for instance. So you can measure space with second or nanosecond in this case. Or if you are perverse, you can try to measure time with meters. So you can uh, label your watch. And, and of course you have this uh, full 12 hours of the watch or maybe 60 minutes on a watch. And you can try to measure with, with the kilometers if you like. It's a big number, 
So one second would correspond to uh, uh, 300,000 kilometers, but you can put a tick mark and 300,000 kilometers next to it. And you can measure seconds using kilometers that way, if you like. And so that's possible using speed of light as well. It's not a very convenient unit, but at least you can do it that way. So that's why we would like to treat now space and time on an equal footing. And for example, if you decide to measure everything in terms of meters, then you are using time measured in meters. So then CT is the quantity that comes together with X, Y, and Z. And then CT, X, and Y, Z form a four vector. So vector with four components, which transform under spatial rotation but also under Lorentz transformation as well. So this vector C, T, X, Y, and Z is usually labeled X with a Greek index mu upstairs. And there is a distinction between index upstairs and, 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 and the downstairs. And, and when it's upstairs, it refers to the C, T, X, Y, Z. And this kind of vector is called contravariant vector as opposed to covariant vector for the reason I'm going to tell you in a moment. So this Lorentz index mu takes values from 0, 1, 2, and 3. A 1, 2, 3 corresponds to the familiar spatial index of x, y, and z. 0 refers to actually time component. But time component, of course, is, is supposed to have the same unit as space. And therefore, x0 is ct, not just t. So using this contravariant vector for the space-time coordinate, x0 is ct, x1 is x, x2 is y, x3 is z. So that's what this contravariant vector is about. And when you talk about Lorentz transformations, Lorentz transformation is defined to be set of four by four matrices that would leave this combination invariant. c squared dt squared, minus dx squared, minus dy squared, minus dz squared. And I think the meaning of this is pretty obvious. When something is traveling at the speed of light, its trajectory will follow the direction where this combination always vanishes. Because dx, dy, dz, that's a distance light travels, is given by c times dt, and therefore this whole combination vanishes. And light travels with speed of light in any reference frame. That's what the relativity tells us. So the, the condition that this vanishes has to be the same no matter what reference frame you take. So that's why you need to keep this combination invariant under arbitrary change of the reference frames, namely Lorentz transformation. So to keep this combination, which is called the proper distance, fixed under Lorentz transformation, it's convenient to introduce this notation called the metric tensor, G mu nu. A metric tensor is something that becomes really, really important when you go to general relativity, where G mu nu is no longer this simple matrix one minus minus one, but can also depend on space and time called the metric tensor. And that's what describes the general relativity of the theory of gravity. We are not going there. Here, we're just keeping g mu nu to be this constant matrix, 1 minus 1 minus 1 minus 1. It's a diagonal 4 by 4 matrix. It doesn't depend on space time because we are living on what is called the flat Minkowski space. We are not considering general space time like a black hole. So in flat Minkowski space with no gravity, the metric tensor is of this simple form. And using this metric tensor, we can write this d as squared proper distance in this notation g mu nu dx mu dx nu. And so repeated indices are meant to be summed over according to Einstein's convention. And, and when you sum over these indices mu and nu, then indeed this combination g mu nu dx mu dx nu would precisely correspond to this proper, proper distance we just wrote down uh, a minute ago, c squared dt squared minus dx squared minus dy squared minus dz squared. So this minus sign comes from this minus signs in the metric tensor. So at this stage, it may look like a, just a unnecessary complication I introduced here, 
why not just keep using the CT, X, Y, and Z? But it turns out that introducing this metric tensor is useful because whenever you find something Lorentz invariant, that is always meant to be contraction of indices between subscripts and superscripts. You always sum over index downstairs and upstairs. In this case, index mu is summed over. Dx mu, which corresponds to space-time coordinate, has an index upstairs. Metric tensor G mu nu has an index downstairs. And you are summing over all mu's. And same for nu. So this gives you a general idea that whenever you have sum over indices, one index upstairs, one index downstairs, you are making the combination Lorentz invariant. So that's a very useful thing to know. But then you would ask the question, what is the vector with index downstairs? And the answer is simple. So if you stare this combination, g mu nu dx mu dx nu, I can take the first two factors, g mu nu dx mu, mu is summed over, only index that's left over is nu now. So I can write this combination dx nu with nu still being downstairs instead. But then this dx nu inherits minus signs from the metric tensor. So x with the new index downstairs is not the same as x with the new mu index upstairs because the spatial components are now reversed. So x mu with mu index downstairs is ct minus x minus y and minus z. And then you call this vector covariant vector, not contravariant vector. So whenever you reverse the signs of the spatial components, you get this co covariant vector with the index now downstairs. And when you have the vector with the index downstairs, and when you have a vector index upstairs, you can contract the indices to build Lorentz invariant. So that's this notation here. <clears throat> when I have two Lorentz vectors, A and B, and we're gonna talk about example of this, like the full momentum vector, which is the vector that is made up of energy and the spatial momentum. You can do a contraction of indices between let's say full momentum vector A and full space-time coordinates vector B. And there's a dot in between to indicate that that's an inner product. But whenever you define this Lorentz invariant inner product between two vectors, you have to take one of the indices downstairs and one of the indices upstairs and sum over them. It doesn't matter which one you take upstairs and downstairs. You can take A with lower index, B with upper index, or you can take A with upper index and B with lower index. But either way, the sum ends up being the product of two time components minus the inner product of spatial components. And that is the combination that is Lorentz invariant, it turns out. So we talked about various kinds of vectors as we go on, uh, but always you first define the contravariant vectors because that seems to sort of match up the intuition for the vectors we have from non-relativistic physics. But whenever you define Lorentz invariant quantities, you have to remember that you first switch the signs of spatial components to define covariant vector by moving the index downwards and then contract the indices between down, lowercase, uh, uh, sorry, the uh, a downstairs index and upstairs index to form an invariant, which is the same thing as using the metric tensor between two contravariant vectors. So this is what we always do whenever we actually start writing down various quantities in relativity. I don't know if you have seen this before. Let me know if you have or have not. Maybe uh, I just uh, give, uh, ask you to raise your hands if you uh, have seen this uh, before. Only two of you, three, okay. And most of you have not seen this, it looks like. Okay, so then uh, I, I try to go very slowly about this and then remind you that we have to do this uh, contraction of indices between a lower index and upper index every time we see this for uh, for a while. Uh, but I hope at least you got the message. 
So you combine time component and spatial component into a single four vector. That's the first message here because we have to treat space and time on equal footing. And, and whenever you have a four vector, you define the contraction of four vectors to build the Lorentz invariant by using this minus sign coming from this metric tensor. And a convenient way of doing so is by switching the signs of the spatial component to define a covariant vector that has the index lower uh, uh, indices, and then contract the indices between lower index and upper index to define the Lorentz invariant, then you are guaranteed you are talking about Lorentz invariant objects. So that's the main two messages from this slide. Okay, any questions about this? Um, I have a question. Um, you had said uh, um, for light that uh, the dx squared dy squared dc squared is the same mm -hmm. as a c squared dt squared. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm trying to, I can't really think of, okay, can you kind of explain why that would be? Because the dt is a time elapsed, dx dy dz is the distance of travel, and the light goes the speed of light. So the total distance you travel, which is a square root of dx squared plus dy squared plus dz squared, is supposed to be c times dt, the speed of light times the time elapsed. That's why this whole combination has to be zero uh, for along the direction of the travel of the light. So it would usually be like V DT, but specifically for light V is C, and that's why they would have to cancel and light try. Okay. Right. So for light, D S squared is always zero. And D S squared is meant to be proper time I mentioned. So light would never experience time. So that's an infinite time dilation. So if something's moving fast, we have time dilation effect, that's why the cosmic gram muons can reach the surface of the earth because even though they have short lifetime, and that's probably a typical freshman physics problem, right? So muon has a lifetime of 2.2 microsecond. And normally you would think that even if it travel with speed of light, 2.2 microsecond times the speed of light is what? 10 to the 10th, 10 to the minus six, 10 to the fourth, uh, three, it's about 10 to the fifth, that's a, uh, 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 about a kilometer. The muons are produced at about the 20 kilometer uh, altitude from interaction with cosmic rays. So they should have all decayed away before reaching the planet, but they don't. And that's because of time dilation factor. So when something is traveling fast, then the time gets slowed down. And time dilation factor goes like square root of one minus velocity squared over C squared. And when something reaches speed of light, then V is C, the square root of one minus c squared over c squared is zero. So the light, well, whatever that travels the speed of light would never experience time because time is infinitely dilated. And that's what you see this formula. So c squared dt squared minus dx squared minus dy squared minus dz squared is always zero for light. Therefore proper time is zero and light never experiences time. If you have a normal particle with mass, then it doesn't go, go with speed of light. So the distance it can travel, dx squared plus dy squared plus dz squared is always less than c times dt. Then this whole combination is positive. And ds squared is really proper time in that case because you can go to the rest frame of that particle. Rest frame by definition, is where a particle doesn't move. So dx vanishes, dy vanishes, dz vanishes. Then ds squared is nothing but c squared d squared, which is a time elapse in the rest frame. So if you're thinking over your own time in your brain, the how much time ticks in your brain is in your rest frame. And that's cdt is indeed ds squared. And that's why we call this combination proper time. So time really does tick in your brain because you're not traveling the speed of light. But if you're moving, and if somebody's observing you moving, then you are moving. So dx, dy, dz may not be zero. And you, then somebody else is also at a time watch, uh, uh, at the uh, 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 stopwatch, 
so the person can measure the time elapse as you're running in front of the, uh, him or her and measure dt. Then that person knows the time in your brain is ticking at a different rate from time on my stopwatch. Then I have to do the subtraction of dx, dy, dz part to predict how much time must have elapsed in your brain who is running in front of me. So this proper time is something you calculate on your own and should agree with, but only when you take this whole combination because time is now relative. It's not common between you and me. But if you compute this combination, that is common between you and me. And that's why we call this proper time. So whenever you go from one reference frame to another reference frame, this combination is common, which we can compare against each other and agree on. But DT itself, time elapse is not because time ticks with a different rate between you moving in front of me and me at rest. So that's why this combination is the important combination. Everybody has to agree on, and no matter in what reference frame you are in. So the Lorentz transformation, which allows you to go from one reference frame to another, is meant to keep this combination invariant. Does that answer the question, Gerardo? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I think so. Oh, great, great. Any other questions? So all this time dilation and Lorentz contraction stuff might, might sound very mysterious when you first learn about it in relativity, but this, this notation is, is meant to make it purely mechanical. So the idea is that you treat space and time on equal footing, that you always deal with this uh, four vector, and you always talk about Lorentz invariant quantities so that there's no disagreement no matter what reference frame you were in. And then this notation just makes that point completely mechanical. All you have to remember is to reverse the spatial components of any four vector and sum over indices between lower index and upper index. And then you are guaranteed that that combination is Lorentz invariant to begin with. And then you can compare between you and me and so that we can agree on it with each other. So that's why we use this notation so that we don't need to really think every time when we talk about various physical observables, the minute you see a vector index and some over indices between lower and upper index, then you don't have to think about it anymore. It's Lorentz invariant. So that's the reason we talk about this uh, index notation so that we don't have to think about it every time. We just make it sort of mechanical uh, uh, job to make sure that everything is Lorentz invariant. So that's the reason why this kind of notation is actually very useful. Any further questions on this? Especially when you have seen this for the first time, you know, this is a very good place to ask questions about this. Is it okay? Well, so if you still feel uncomfortable about this, you can always ask about this later on. We also have an office hour later, this, later today. So we can always come back and talk about this again, if you would like to see it again. Okay, so here's the next example of this Lorentz four vector. Oh, there's some chat here. I've seen this before, though not to this detail. Okay, thank you, Mashid. And I hope that makes sense. Mashid, is it okay? Can you speak up? Or oh, write in chat? Okay, that's fine too. Yeah, okay, good. I'm glad to know that. All right, so here's the next example of this Lorentz four vector. So under Lorentz transformation, momentum and energy turn into each other. Just like under Lorentz transformation, space and time turn into each other. And we know this because in the rest frame of a particle, particle has energy mc squared, as Einstein told us. But in the rest frame, of course, there is no momentum. But when you go to ref different rest reference frame, particle is now moving, so it has a momentum now. So what's going on here is that this MC, MC squared part of the energy in the rest frame turns into a finite momentum in a different reference frame. So that's how we know that energy and momentum should turn into to each other under Lorentz transformation. But now we have the same problem with the time and space again. Energy and momentum 
are measured in different units. Energy is in joule. Momentum is kil kilogram meters per second. They come in different units. But here again, we use C as a conversion constant. So C is, you know, really again, some mechanical thing here. So it's, it's a conversion constant, just like when you do the conversion between mile and meet kilometer, that the one mile is 1.6 kilometers, it's just a conversion constant. In the same way, the C is used as a conversion constant to unify them to the same unit. So if you take energy and divide it by C, joule by kilometer per second has the unit the same as the momentum because joule is the same thing as kilometer kilogram meter squared per square uh, second squared. If you divide it by, by meter per second, I'm left with only one power of meter per second times kilogram. That's exactly the correct unit for the momentum. So E over C now has the same unit as P. Then I can combine them together into a four vector P mu. Again, the contravariant vector with the mu as an upper index. Then I can talk about mu with the lower index using the metric tensor. I lower the upper index mu to lower index mu using the metric tensor. And that switches the signs of spatial components. And this is now the covariant vector. And by using this contravariant vector and covariant vector, I can now build a Lorentz invariant. P mu, P mu, where mu indices are summed over, but between lower index and upper index. And by definition, that turns into E over C squared from time component squared plus minus Px times Px plus minus Py times Py plus minus Pz times Pz. As a result, this is negative P vector squared. And you probably have seen this before in freshman physics that this combination E over C squared minus P squared is M squared C squared. Maybe you haven't seen in this form, but rather in the other form, namely the energy of a relativistic particle is given by the square root of P squared C squared plus M squared C to the fourth. And if you do a Taylor expansion of this but by taking M as a big number, P as a small perturbation, then the theta expansion starts with MC squared, that's the rest of the energy. And first term in P is P squared 2M, that's the usual kinetic energy we uh, use in uh, non relativistic mechanics. Then comes negative P squared by AD, M, 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 M cubed C, C squared, and dot, dot, dot. So that's the, the way we can identify kinetic energy in a non relativistic limit. But if you rewrite this equation, I hope you have seen, it turns into this equation rather. So I take square of the both sides. I move E squared on the other side. I move uh, M squared C squared, uh, sorry, I move the P squared C squared the other side. I only leave M, M squared C to the fourth on this side and divide both sides of a C squared. Then you find this equation over here. So E squared C squared minus P squared is indeed M squared C squared. And M is a mass of the particle. Mass doesn't depend on the reference frame. It's a constant, which is a specific number for a given particle. So it's a Lorentz invariant. So indeed, this combination you built out of one contravariant vector and one covariant vector, summing over the indices between upstairs and downstairs, indeed does give you something Lorentz invariant, such as the mass of the particle. So that, yes, another example that once you actually use this notation of the up, upper index and lower index, it's just a mechanical thing. You sum over indices between upper and lower indices, and you're guaranteed to find something Lorentz invariant. And when you take the massless limit, like a photon, M vanishes, and therefore E, and you can take square root now as PC, and that's the expression you have seen already before, namely the for a photon energy is C times the momentum. And you're probably using that in working out the current, the homework problem. So that's how you can use this notation of upper and lower indices to identify something that's Lorentz invariant, such as the mass of the particle. 
Another thing you notice is the typical plane wave we use in quantum mechanics or electromagnetism always has this form of e to the minus i e t minus p x over h bar, right? So if you solve the Schrodinger equation, you find this e to the minus i e t over h bar as a time evolution for a energy eigenstate. And the plane wave for a definite momentum is, is e to the plus i p dot x over h bar. And they combine together to this expression e to the minus i e t minus p x over h bar. But this e t minus p x is actually a contraction between p with lower index and x with an upper index or vice versa. Because one of them has a lower index. So if you look at the time component p naught x naught, that's a product of e over c times c t you had on a previous slide. E over C times CT is ET, that's up here. Then comes minus P dot X, because either one of them is, has to be up, up uh, the lower index. Then ET minus PX is this Lorentz invariant contraction between P mu and X mu. And we normally write it uh, without showing this index explicitly as P dot X to indicate that we are talking about this Lorentz invariant in a product. So here you have to be careful, right? So dot, when you use, uh, when you have seen in the usual vector calculus, was meant to be in a product where you sum each component with the same sign. That's what you used to do in the inner product between three vectors. But inner product between four vectors involves this minus sign for the spatial components. So when you write this p dot x, and if you think that this is just the inner product of p and x, and write e over c times c t plus p x x plus p y y plus p z z, that's wrong. That's not Lorentz invariant. You have to be sure that you lower one of the indices and therefore switch the signs of spatial components. And p dot x is supposed to be this combination, e t minus p dot x then this combination is guaranteed to be Lorentz invariant. And indeed, this is the combination that appears for plane waves. So you have been using this expression without realizing that this combination was already automatically Lorentz invariant, but in retrospect, that makes sense. We know physics is Lorentz invariant. Even though you take non relativity limit of the, uh, the Lorentz invariant objects, you are still looking at the same combination because it originates from physics, which is ultimately Lorentz invariant. That's why you have been actually staring at this combination E t minus P x all along in quantum mechanics and, and electromagnetism without realizing that this combination was supposed to be coming from the requirement that it has to be Lorentz invariant. But now you appreciate that fact. So this is one of those examples that when you're looking at the physics before realizing relativity, Secretly, there was this relativity already built in because physics was, after all, Lorentz invariant, but you didn't appreciate it before. So this combination of ET minus PX, indeed, is Lorentz invariant, and that's why it qualifies as a plane wave solution, even in Lorentz invariant physics. And I hope this gives you yet another idea on how this four vector comes about and how you can use it to build these Lorentz invariants. So let me pause here again. I'm sure there are questions. Um, is there always an associated four vector uh, with any Lorentz invariant quantity or vice versa? Oh, uh, this is uh, Earl? Uh, yes. Okay, yeah, so it depends on the quantity though. For example, when you talk about a spin or angular momentum in general, spin or angular momentum, we normally think is a vector, right? But it doesn't generalize to four vector. It turns out that angular momentum is a part of a two by two second rank anti-symmetric tensor. So if you have a two by two anti-symmetric matrix, you can ask the question how many components they are. So that's uh, four choose two, that's six components, right? 
And it turns out that angular momentum is the three out of that six. You have additional three. And those additional three corresponds to Lorentz boost. If you remember that angular momentum is a neural uh, charges uh, from the rotational invariance of space. And as we uh, discussed before, that the Noether's theorem also goes the other way. Once you have a conserved quantity, they become the generators of the symmetry. So if you put the angular momentum operator in the exponent, you can define the unitary operator of the spatial rotation. Now, spatial rotation is a part of this entire transformations of the Lorentz transformations in general. And what is there as a part of Lorentz transformation, which is not the spatial rotation, is the Lorentz boost. And Lorentz boost can be done in all three directions, x, y, and z. So you have three additional symmetries of Lorentz boost. So together with the three directions of spatial rotation around x axis, y axis, and z axis, together with Lorentz boost in x direction, y direction and z direction, you have six transformations altogether. And those six transformations are part of this two by two matrices, anti-symmetric matrix. So spin doesn't generalize the Lorentz vector, but rather generalizes to an anti-symmetric two by two matrix, which is called M mu nu. So you have two indices because it's, an, it's a matrix mu nu. And m nu nu has to be negative n nu mu because it's anti-symmetric. That's why you have only six components rather than four by four, 16 components. And out of these the six components, m12, m13, m23 are the spatial components which correspond to angular momenta. And m01, m02, m03, that's also on this side, uh, correspond to the Lorentz boost. And all together, they form this uh, two by two matrices. So depending on the physical quantities, you have to first ask the question, how does it generalize in a Lorentz uh, 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 invariant fashion? And the, the momentum generalizes to Lorentz four vector together with the energy. Spatial coordinates generalizes to Lorentz four vector together with time, but angular momentum vector generalizes to this anti-symmetric a two index quantity m mu nu uh, uh, in the Lorentz transformation. So you have to ask this question first before knowing what how it generalizes to a Lorentz invariant uh, 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 object. Does that answer your question, Earl? Hmm. Yeah. Okay, Actually. we'll see more about this in, in the next slide. So hopefully that will clarify that question, but that's an excellent question, Earl. Any other questions? Yeah, Professor, can you go over what the difference between um, the first two bullet points are, the P mu and the P sub mu? Yeah, so P mu has index upstairs. Then this is sort of a natural object always, contravariant vector is always a natural object, which has the usual spatial components of the momentum together with the energy divided by C to put that on the same unit. When you move the upper index to a lower index, you revert the signs of the spatial components. And the reason why that is the right thing to do is because the lowering the index has to do with using this metric tensor. If you have a contravariant vector with upper index and contract that with the lower indices of this metric tensor, you contract over mu indices, so that's gone now, but you are left with the lower index nu. But when you sum over this indices nu, you have this minus signs part of this metric tensor. So you end up changing the spatial components to the reverse with the opposite signs. That's for the X downstairs mu and same thing for P downstairs mu. So whenever I go from upper index to lower index, you are secretly using this metric tensor for that operation. And therefore you revert the signs of the spatial components, both for the space time vector and also for this full momentum vector. Does that answer your question, Marshit? Yeah, yeah, thank you. Okay, good. Any further questions? Again, this notation may get some time to getting used to, 
But once you get used to it, it actually really simplifies everything we do with relativity. All you have to do is always remember you contract between lower and upper indices, then you are done. Uh, whatever you do is always guaranteed to be Lorentz invariant. And that's how you can make all these uh, algebras very mechanical without thinking uh, when you actually do uh, all kinds of uh, uh, calculations with it. Further questions? It's okay. Again, we can always come back to this slide as well. So now we would like to define derivatives. Now derivative is defined with a, 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 a space and time. And we are trying to define the gradient with respect to a space and time. So then derivative operator has x, and x mu is the contravariant vector of t and x, y, z. But as you can see here, then x mu appears downstairs when you define a derivative. So when you define derivative with respect to space and time, derivative operator starts out with the index defined downstairs. And of course, time comes together with C, CT is X naught. Derivative with respect to CT is one over C times delta T by the chain rule. So this is the first component of this derivative vector, del naught. And then I have del x, del y, and del z. But remember, this is supposed to be covariant vector because mu is downstairs. And when you define del mu x mu this way, you can see that this is four because this is one over c del t acting on c t, that's one. Del x acting on x, that's one. Del y acting on y, that's one. Del z acting on z, that's one. 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1 is 4. And that's nothing but the dimension of space time, which is a Lorentz invariant concept. No matter what reference frame you are in, space time dimension is 4. Indeed, this del mu x mu is Lorentz invariant. But if I had done it wrongly, thinking that this is actually a contravariant vector instead, then del mu x mu would require flipping the sign of the spatial components then del mu x mu would be one minus one minus one minus one. I get minus two. That's the wrong answer for a space time dimension. So now you see the evidence that I really should regard this derivative operator to be covariant vector because once you put x mu downstairs as a derivative, index is indeed downstairs. So this derivative operator is a covariant vector. And using two covariant vectors, then I can define what is called the Lambertian, which is the analogy to the Laplacian in the spatial components. And again, to make sure that I build something, build something Lorentz invariant, I built this Lorentz invariant contraction between upper indices and lower indices. I can do it with g mu nu, del mu, del nu, which is the same thing as raising new index to new index upstairs which requires me to revert the signs of the spatial derivatives. And end result is one over C squared del T squared minus spatial index uh, derivative squared. And spatial inverse uh, derivative squared is the Laplacian. It's usually written by this uh, delta because we refer to three dimensional space. That's why delta has a three uh, 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 vertices. And this is the Laplacian in three dimensions. When you include time, then that combination requires this minus sign in between because of this metric tensor. Then you are defining Lorentz invariant derivative in four dimensions. That's why the Lambertian is written with a square with four vertices instead of Laplacian with three vertices. So this the Lambertian is meant to be Lorentz invariant derivative operator in four dimensional space time. And what do you learn in quantum mechanics is that h bar times i times derivative is something that would correspond to the momentum. So if you act i h bar del mu on this plane wave factor we talked about on previous slide, del mu would hit x mu upstairs. 
and then that pulls out p mu downstairs from the exponent. And you find p mu acting on this wave, uh, plane wave factor. And this is the origin why in quantum mechanics, Hamiltonian was I h bar delta, but momentum was h bar over i derivative. So sine was the opposite, if you remember this. And the reason being that once you define derivative like this one, spatial derivative will pull out p naught. P naught is energy over C. But spatial derivative, sorry, time derivative will pull out T naught. And P naught is E over C. That's a Hamiltonian over C. But the spatial derivative will pull out P with lower index, which is negative P. And to compensate for the negative sign, I need to change the sign on the left-hand side. Changing I to minus I is the same thing as H bar over I. That's the way usually momentum operator is written in quantum mechanics. So the origin of the difference between Hamiltonian with I and momentum with H bar over I actually comes from the fact that you have to switch the signs for the, uh, uh, the, the full momentum vector when it's actually a covariant vector, which this derivative operator is. So then everything is now consistent. Again, this is something you have been using it all the time in quantum mechanics without realizing that true origin for this minus sign actually comes from relativity. And physics is relativistic, Lorentz invariant. So it, it turned out to be the physics we were describing without knowing it already secretly relied on this Lorentz invariant combination. But now you see it very explicitly here. The derivative operator is a covariant vector because mu is downstairs. That's why when you act derivative on the plane wave factor, you pull out P with the lower index mu. That's why you have opposite signs for time component for the energy and spatial component for the momentum when you express it using the derivative operator, which you already know from the quantum mechanics. In addition, if you act Lambertian on the, uh, this plane wave factor, times h bar squared, when also minus sign with the i, that would then pull out p mu upstairs and p mu downstairs in the Lorentz invariant contraction because of the g mu nu. And that p squared, or p dot p, is m squared c squared, as we talked about on the previous slide. So now it's coming to the point that we seem to be getting some kind of wave equation. Time derivative squared minus spatial derivative squared gives you a constant. And that's a wave equation. And that's indeed what we call the klein gordon equation. So we try to use this fact that you find some kind of wave equation using this Lorentz invariant notation of the Lambertian so that we can come up with a Lagrangian that would reproduce that wave equation. And that becomes a klein gordon field theory. And once you have the field theory, we already have a, a procedure to quantize the field theory by using canonical momentum and canonical coordinate and see what we get out of it. So once you actually have this Lorentz uh, invariant notation, which is very useful to build up everything Lorentz invariant fashion, then you can just go ahead and start writing down a Lorentz invariant field equation and Lorentz invariant Lagrangian, and then try to make sense out of it by quantizing it. So this is how we can sort of get quickly started in building Lorentz invariant quantum field theory the minute you are exposed to this kind of notation. Okay, let me stop here again. Uh, so I'm sure there, there are questions about this. Isn't it kind of surprising that uh, the sign difference between energy and momentum you have known all along in quantum mechanics actually was relativity, but you've known that all, all the time. Any questions? Oh, oh uh, yeah, I had a good question. Go um, ahead. What's the difference between like the metric tensor written with uh, superscripts mu nu and subscripts mu nu? Ah, sorry, that's a good question. I didn't explain this, I apologize. So G mu nu, and if you contract with a G nu rho downstairs with the nu, nu indices up and down, that becomes delta mu rho, which is one. So what G mu upstairs then has the meaning of the inverse matrix. 
of G menu downstairs because their product, some of the indices would give you one. And, and that inverse matrix may be different from G menu when you actually go to a general relativity, but within a special relativity we're dealing with right now, G menu is just a diagonal matrix of eigenvalues plus one, minus one, minus one, minus one, minus one, minus one. The inverse of this matrix is also the same matrix, plus one, minus one, minus one, minus one. So it turns out that G menu downstairs and G menu upstairs are the same thing. But to be more correct, the G menu upstairs has the meaning of being the inverse matrix of G menu downstairs, which that distinction does become important when you go to general relativity. So don't remember G menu upstairs being the same as G menu upstairs because that might confuse you later on when you get to study general relativity at some point. So remember this G menu as an inverse matrix of G menu downstairs to be safe. And, but it turns out that for special relativity, G menu is just unit uh, the uh, uh, diagonal matrix of plus one, minus, minus one, minus one. And therefore this actually turns out to be the same matrix. So thank you for asking the question. I failed to explain it. So I appreciate that. Yeah. Thank you, Miguel. Yeah, that's it. Mm -hmm. that, that was exactly what I was thinking, which I just wanted to confirm. Thank you. Good, thank you. Any other questions? Everything okay so now, for now? Okay, so now we can explicitly work out what Lorentz transformation should be. So A dot B as a Lorentz invariant product is basically A and B written as a column vector. You take the transpose of A vector so that you can contract the indices, but without summing the indices directly, you need to stick in this metric in between to revert the signs of the spatial components of B. So A dot B, as we have been written with the explicit tensor notation, can also be written in this matrix notation. I have B as a column vector, and the column vector transpose is a row vector. I stick in G as a matrix in between, and that's the same thing as A dot B as a Lorentz invariant product we were talking about on the previous three slides, right? I hope that's clear. Then asking the question, what could be Lorentz transformation that would keep this inner product unchanged? Because that's a definition of the Lorentz transformation that the A dot B is supposed to be Lorentz invariant. So it shouldn't change according to Lorentz transformation. Then you do the change of this B vector to L times B by acting this matrix L on it. You do the same thing for the A vector L times A, but this thing is now transpose. And this is supposed to be the same as before. And L A transpose is the same thing as A transpose L transpose. So the requirement then turns out to be L transpose G L is the same as the original G. This is now the requirement of keeping this inner product A dot B unchanged before and after the Lorentz transformation. Then you can go ahead and write these matrices. And the rotation part is actually obviously a Lorentz transformation consistent with this fact, because if you choose L to be the rotation of the lower three by three matrix uh, components by an orthogonal matrix, that doesn't affect time component Spatial component is an identity matrix minus one. So I have O transpose minus one O. Minus one is identity matrix, I can factor it out. Then O transpose O is one as a definition of the rotation matrix or orthogonal matrix. So it doesn't change. So the spatial part is obvious that that satisfies this requirement of keeping this Lorentz invariant inner product unchanged. And of course you knew that because A dot B is A dot B naught minus vector A dot vector B. Vector A dot vector B is the inner product of the space, which doesn't change according to spatial rotation. So you knew that already, but it's just checking that it satisfies the same requirement. But when L involves time, becomes more non-trivial for obvious reasons. And that is what happens when we are talking about the Lorentz boost. 
And when you talk about Lorentz boost along the X direction, then you're talking about this Lorentz transformation matrix that involves time component and X component. So you are looking at the upper two by two block. And if I parameterize this upper two by two block by using these parameters for gamma and beta in this fashion, this is L. L transpose is the same because this is a symmetric matrix. Then you can just go ahead and, and multiply these matrices, this gamma, gamma, beta, gamma, beta, gamma on one minus one. And again, this matrix that actually turns into this. And this octagonal component actually cancels, which is good. And diagonal component remains as gamma squared times one minus beta squared. But this is supposed to be the same as the original metric G. So this has to be one. That tells you that the gamma has to be one over square root one minus beta squared. And so once you satisfy this, this one, one, zero, zero component returns to one, which is good. But at the same time, that also guarantees that this one, one component also returns to minus one as the original metric tensor. That's also good. So now this parameterization between gamma and beta satisfies the requirement of a proper Lorentz transformation that doesn't change Lorentz invariant objects. And that's how you know that this transformation is a legitimate Lorentz transformation. And then it takes a little bit of imagination to figure out that this beta has the meaning of the velocity over C, how much you perform the Lorentz boost. And that's something you know, because if you take beta to be a small parameter and do expansion, then you can see that amount of transformation you do really corresponds to changing X to X minus VT. So that's how you know that beta has the meaning of V over C for the Lorentz boost. But now we have a full expression that involves the square root without doing a Taylor expansion in small beta. This expression is now valid even when beta approaches speed of light. And it is guaranteed that this is legitimate Lorentz boost because it keeps this Lorentz invariant product A dot B unchanged. So it qualifies as a Lorentz transformation. But now we can trust this expression to higher orders in beta. You don't need to think about theta expansion anymore. And then this gamma and beta together would describe this proper Lorentz transformation going from one reference frame to another reference frame that's moving along the X direction relative to the original reference frame. So that's how we figure out that what are the possible Lorentz transformations you are supposed to do in order to keep this Lorentz invariant product unchanged. And that requirement forces the matrix to have this particular form written in terms of beta. Gamma is now a derived quantity as a function of beta. So beta is now the only parameter. And that defines a Lorentz boost to go from one reference frame to another. So that's how you know what are the possible Lorentz transformations you can make to go from one reference frame to another so everything is now derived from this requirement of the Lorentz invariance. And you don't have to think, again, this is just purely mechanical uh, uh, study. What is the matrix that will preserve this metric tensor by sandwiching from the both sides? So that's how you know that the Lorentz transformation is something you can derive from this requirement. There's no putting around anymore, no guessing. Just by knowing that Lorentz invariant objects should remain invariant under no matter what reference frame you take, and what are the allowed forms of the Lorentz transformation gets fixed by this requirement. And then you know what is the proper form of the Lorentz boost. Okay, any questions about this? Maybe this becomes clear on the next slide. So let me just flash it. So once you know what the proper Lorentz boost is, you can do a Lorentz boost of the full vector from the rest frame, which is MC squared over C, so that's MC and rest frame, no momentum here. That's the full momentum vector in the rest frame. But then I, I can do a Lorentz transformation so the arbitrary frame, 
using the vector, the matrix we just discovered on the previous slide. We just multiply them together and obtain this Lorentz four vector. Now I see gamma mc times c is the energy in that rest frame. And if you remember what gamma was supposed to be, that's one over square root one minus beta squared. So I now see that mc squared over the square root one minus beta squared is the energy in the moving reference frame. And you have probably seen this expression as a kinetic energy of a massive particle with a velocity v. In the same way, momentum vector along the x direction here is gamma mc beta. So I multiply beta on this. Beta is v over c. So it cancels one factor of c, and that gives you beta. And I need to divide further by c to make sure that the unit is correct. Then I predict the momentum vector in this reference frame is mv over square root one minus beta squared. And you might have seen this expression also from freshman physics. And when beta is small, I can ignore beta squared downstairs, and that returns to mv, that's a Newtonian mechanics in non relativistic limit. But for the finite velocity with approaches speed of light, you have an enhancement by one over beta squared. So even though V never reaches speed of light, momentum can become bigger than MC and can become a very big number. So this is the expression for energy momentum you may have seen elsewhere, but now I, we can derive this expression by the requirement that Lorentz invariance allows only for this kind of matrix. And using this kind of matrix, I can do a transformation from the rest frame to the moving frame. Then I can now predict what the energy and momentum should be in this reference frame without thinking, without putting around, without guessing, it is all derived. So that's the, uh, the main advantage of using this matrix notation or tensor notation using these indices. Then there's no freedom anymore. Everything becomes purely mechanical exercise of these uh, linear algebra. Then you know what the energy should be, momentum should be in the arbitrary frame. And that's the beauty of using this tensor notation and Lorentz invariance. I hope that makes sense. Okay, let me stop here. Uh, any questions? Okay, so time is already up. So uh, let me stop here. And, uh, uh, and if you have any questions, you can come to the office hour. And I post a new homework problem later today. Okay. Have a good weekend. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.